Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Where Do We Begin? My name is Harper. My co-host is back. Goes by the name of Lockie. How are you on this tremendous day? Lockie. Back like a bad rash. Yeah, super excited to be here and pumped for another special episode with Jay North. He's an absolute superstar and an even better bloke. I'm super excited to get into it. What about yourself, Harps? Oh, yeah, I am super pumped. Uh, another footballer, um, soccer player. So second week in a row of that. It's really good. Hope you guys enjoy it. Get straight into it, do you reckon, Lockie? Mate, after you described it as really good, I'm keen to get into it. Let's dive in. Okay, this guest, it's one that we've been waiting to speak to for a long, long time. 41 caps for the Socceroos, couple A-League titles here, a couple NSL titles there. A uh, very extremely decorated football player in Australia. He goes by the name of Jade North. Welcome to the show, Jade. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I think that's the second time I think I've heard you say that intro, and it's good to speak again for our listeners. Unfortunately, we've tried to record this a couple of times, had a few technical issues, so fingers crossed it all goes to plan, but it is absolutely a pleasure to see you again, Jade, even uh, if it's just over the Zoomers thip here. Yeah, no, thank you. Last time we spoke, I was up in Cairns um, using the hotel internet, which wasn't too 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 good, so hopefully tonight will be um, there will be good, full surprises with my kids might be walking in and out, so we'll, um, we'll see how we go. <laughs> I look forward to seeing a couple of surprise guests then. Now, I guess we'll start off with just a real, really simple question. Just tell us a little bit about your early life, in particular growing up. Is it Taree? Is that how I say it? Yeah, so Taree, it's um, the mid-north coast of New South Wales. That's where I was born and born and raised. And obviously, um, it's a bit sad at, the, at this present time with a lot of all the floods and that are happening around, um, especially where my, all my family and, and, and friends are at the moment. So, you know, big shout out to everyone there and hopefully everyone stay safe but um yeah i grew up in in Tari, mid north coast which is a uh, not too far from newcastle where i've got sort of fond memories of, of growing up as well but um yeah just sort of played and grew up there moved to queensland and when, when i was when i was eight eight years old and, and went to primary school up there so i've been up in queensland you know ever since you know i'd say i'm more of a queenslander these days than an actual new south welshman but um yeah, it's, it's been a great, Queensland's been great to me and my family. Oh, I guess you sort of touched on it at the end, so I'm not a big rugby fan, I don't know if you are, so then State of Origin, growing up in New South Wales, growing up in um, Queensland, who, who do you go for when that's on? Oh, definitely, you know, I've got to go for Queensland. I've, I've, played, <laughs> I've, I've played for Queensland, I've, um, you know, I've like represented at, um, national titles, I've played all my reps here, I was with the Queensland Academy of Sport, you know, back in the old National Soccer League. And, you know, it would be sort of similar like to Greg Inglis. He was born in, you know, not too far from up near Kempsey Way and, and he represented Queensland. So, you know, um, obviously that's that, that's why I do follow him. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you touched on it, moving to, from Tare to Queensland, uh, moving, to interstate, moving interstate as a kid is a pretty big move to make. Can I ask why the move? Yeah, it was, you know, growing up, growing up in an Aboriginal community, you know, I grew up with a, you know, my mum and my dad separated, you know, for various reasons, and, um, you know, mum was 19 when she had when she had me, so it was, it was um, you know, it was, it was quite tough, and I had to, she wanted a better life for us to, to move out move out of Tari, and, you know, I'm fortunate that we, um, that we did, did make the move, and, you know, obviously from my hometown where I'm from, it's either, you know, rugby league stronghold town, or, you know, my, my my father and all my uncles, they were into boxing as well. So that's why uh, I can always, it's good to tell the um, round ball story and why, I'm, you know, why I, I love it and why I followed it as a, as a youngster. Yeah, so I guess what got, got you into soccer, you t- touched on it just then, because obviously, like you said, rugby league dominated states, your um, pa- uh, father and uncles were massively into boxing. So what drew you to the sport? It's... It's um, because all my friends at school were uh, into into football, especially down the Gold Coast. Even still today, when I've got three boys, and whenever we play against the Gold Coast Knights or Gold Coast United, you know they're always very strong. And um, even back when I was younger, growing up, I was playing for Burley Bulldogs back in the day at Pizzy Park there. And um, you know, through my under eights and under nines, I think it was, and you know, we had a great little team. 
And um, yeah, just because my mates were right into it, so I pretty much I pretty much followed suit. That seems to be a really common answer, isn't it, Harps? That a lot of people, they sort of get into this sport that they obviously yeah. take into a, in a professional career because their mates were doing it when they were younger. Yeah, and it makes sense, eh? Hey? Yeah, well, look, you know, it's um, it, it's, a, it's a great thing, sport, because sport is a connector, and that's why I'm so, such an advocate, in, especially in, in the Indigenous community, you know, to try to help the youngsters and mentor, you know, our younger generation because, you know, it's... Um, it is a, dis- a minority group. It's very heavily um, disadvantaged in, in, in some areas of Australia. So, and sport seems to be the common theme that all Indigenous kids, you know, really look up to their role models. And you, you look in the rugby league and the AFL how well they do it. And that's why I felt that was part of my journey to be, you know, as a role Indigenous role model to come through and, and really show these kids that it's um, the sport is a way out. And if you choose and follow your dreams, you can have a lot of success. Mm, and I've heard you speak before on uh, in other interviews how you say that Indigenous kids are just really well suited to the sport uh, quite often, and uh, you hardly see uh, any Indigenous uh, Aussie footballers, which is, like, I'm sure we're going to touch on this later, but it's just uh, not not really happy to think about that. It's a bit, a bit of a sad thought. And what, what was it like being one of, if not the only, Indigenous guy playing football, soccer at the time when you were growing up? Yeah, it was, it was you know, there's a lot of factors. Obviously, if you look at the other codes, AFL and Rugby League, they they typically, oh, they, they do it very well with all the programs they've got put in place. And, you know, they're, they're an odd. If you say they've been around commercially, you know, um, in that space a lot longer, you know, if we if we sort of go back to when the A League started, you know, we're still a young league, and even before that, when I was part of the NSL, there wasn't much that sort of connection with with Indigenous talent. So, you know, we've been up up against it against the other codes, and you know, that's always been a factor of you know, what I've been trying to do as a as a mentor and a role model in the Indigenous community. But um, yeah, it's it it yeah, it's a bit weird when you're in a in the A League and you're you know myself and Travis Dodd. At one stage, there was Casey Wehrman, but um, there wasn't any consistent sort of players. And then the sort of younger generation, yeah, Adam Sorotas, David Williams, James Brown, just to name a few, were the ones that were coming through. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's a, we're, we're still a long way away. But um, and also, obviously, the fees are quite high in football in Australia, and you know, especially for a lot of the Indigenous communities and underprivileged kids. It, it's a tough one to be able to afford the fees and registrations for for football. And, you know, even when I was growing up, I had like, uh, it'd be the camps, you know, for two, three hundred dollars. So my mum had to like help, you know, get, you know, get loans off people just to pay that, whereas other families could pay that, no problem. I'd always be having secondhand fares of boots and, and all that sort of stuff, you know. So it is, it was, it was tough. But, um, you know, I had a single mother, had to work two, or three jobs just to put food on the table at times. So, you know, um, I'm just one of those. There's, there's plenty more out there that don't get the opportunity. Yeah, two or three hundred dollars. That is a lot of money. That would be, I think, my registration fee for p- playing football is about two hundred and fifty. So that is a that is a lot of money just for a, a camp. And I know speaking to people, well, this is going it, back twenty years. Yeah, and twenty yeah. years ago, 20, twenty five years ago, longer. You know, so yeah. Yeah, thirty years ago. So two hundred dollars back then. You know, it's a lot of money. That is a lot of money, and it's, I guess it's why it's so hard for the sport to be, I guess, accessed by the everybody, which is obviously disappointing. And I'd be interested to know, what is the A-League doing to, I guess, try help, I guess, promote that sport? Because I know, like, the AFL does, like, has the Next Generation Academy, and they uh, do things like that to try and promote the sport, I guess, throughout Australia. Does the A-League do anything like that for the Indigenous community to pr- promote soccer? Oh, look, I don't think... No, no, no. The, uh, the FA, they're really working hard in this space at the moment, you know, um, especially under James Johnson, our CEO, who's under his leadership has been fantastic in, in regards to uh, identifying that that problem. You know, he's working hard in that space and that's an area that they've recognised. And, you know, to be part of um, myself and Kyle Simon at the moment, we're, we're part of a, the FA in that Indigenous space to help, you know, uh, make changes in the game at a national governing body uh, position. So, um, and you've got other, other, um, you know, uh, sporting 
our foundations like the JMF who, you know, they've, they've been around for, for quite some time as well. So John Moriarty Foundation, that is, yeah? Yeah, yeah. In, 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 you know, that have been advocates in, you know, trying to help with Indigenous football. So, you know, we're, we're, we're pushing up a, you know, uh, a big hill against uh, some of the other codes and, you know, um, that's what I want to be able to, to, to help is, you know, to, to work with pathways and, you know, form relationships with the A-League to, you know, be able to have some sort of a – if you have a look at the AFL, I think there's 7 to 8 or 9% in every roster there's in, Indigenous make up the team. So, for me, that's just – and if you look at the NRL grand final or, you know, even the Queensland State of Origin team, you know, half of it's Indigenous players, you know, even the Kangaroos. So, you know, we've still, we still got a long way to go, but, you know, I'm, I'm very um, hopeful of the future. So is Football can Australia, they consulting with you and how taking on board your ideas and how they can promote the game more in that area? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, we're obviously Kai's doing really well. She's a, she's a superstar of the, of, of the game. And, and, you know, the girls have actually, it's really, it's really, um, it's really great to see that the girls are showing the way. And then, especially yeah. with the brand of the Matildas and the World Cup coming here, it's a perfect time for the whole this whole Legacy 23 that I've been a part of as well, help promoting with um, you know um, inclusion, women's you know all of it based around the um, diversity as well and opportunity, especially in the Indigenous. So those are sort of the pillars that we're really driving home, especially with this Legacy 23 as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, and you're speaking about. Uh, the A League and the FA, but of course the predecessor uh, to the A League, of course the NSL. So you came into that when it was kind of on its last legs uh, in the late nineties, I believe. You started playing as a teenager. So what was that whole feeling like of uh, playing in this kind of dying league, dying before your eyes, and being an up and comer at that time? Yeah, it was. Um it was great because I was only 16 at the time when I when I debuted for the Brisbane Strikers and John Cosmina was my coach back in the day. So I'm forever grateful that John gave me an opportunity. And, um, you know, you're, you're 16 years old and I was still going to school and you're playing, you're playing alongside, you know, men that could, um, you know, it was, uh, you know, you had to grow up very quickly under John Cosmina and some of the players that we had to play with. But um, it was a great experience and, you know, um, you know, it was back in 90, 99, so it wasn't too far after they won the grand final back in 97, 90, yeah, I'll have to look back at it, but it's a, it's a long time ago, but um, yeah, and then obviously my last little bit with, with the NSL was with Perth Glory, before the, the we just won the league with Perth Glory, and then obviously they made the decision to, you know, um, put an end to the NSL, and then still had a bit of cooling off period before they put in the, the, the A-League in, so that retired a lot of really good players that I played with, you know, especially when I was playing at Olympic and, um, you know, like the Troy Halpin to Tommy Pondiax. I know, sorry, um, Tommy did play in, that, uh, in the uh, A-League after that, but there was a number of players that did retire, which is which was quite sad because there was a period of probably nearly six months, I think it was, where there was no football whatsoever, maybe even a bit longer. Uh, yeah, I think it was um, about 16 months, my research was saying. And, of course, you played with the uh, great Damian Mori, the top Australian National League goal scorer of all time. We were chatting about that a couple of weeks ago on the phone. Uh, amazing career he had. But um, I, wa- I wanted to talk about that big break between the end of the NSL and the start of the A-League because you're still a pretty young guy. Uh, you, I don't think you're a teenager anymore. But w- how do you cope with that break and not being uh, – in Europe, like some of the uh, Redukas or the Kules, but staying in Australia with a 16th month break between games, what's that like? Yeah, look, it was it was tough, and luckily I had a bit of savings from the previous years of, of you know living away from home at 19, 20 when I was at Olympic and things like that. But um, yeah, if I didn't have that, it would have been I would have been in trouble. You know, I I I never I didn't have a passport to go overseas, and and when I did go overseas, I, I just wasn't. I didn't have the right mentality or I wasn't good enough at the time. So, and then, you know, I pretty much just stayed and I wasn't, I wasn't really driven like you, you do see the other players. Like, you, you know, there's a number of players that have made, you know, great careers overseas, but you know, I just uh, I just never really had it in me to, to really, you know, to take that, that next step until, you know, when I was in my late sort of tw- 20s, I think it was, until I made a, a move overseas and even still people – um, even past agents or one in particular would always um, 
So if you've got to do your study, if you don't make, if you don't go overseas by 23, you can pretty much finish. But you know, when everyone else 28 and you know um, played in the J League for two years and played in the K League as well. So and then in Norway as well. So it, it was great that you know that you can pave a, a way later in your career as well. It doesn't have to be when you're younger, but obviously when you're getting older, you got kids, you got bills to pay, and all this sort of stuff. So. And it probably goes back to when I was younger, not not having, you know, any sort of direction or any mentors around, you know, with the, the father figure sort of thing really guiding me and, and pushing me to, to, to for better heights, you know. So, and that's what you see a lot of broken homes and through the Indigenous and, and things like that. It's just there's a you see it in the rugby league, you know, these big these kids get these big contracts coming down from the bush, and all they want to do is get back on the next train. You know, they don't want to bling bling. They don't want to. They just want to get back to go fishing and hanging out with the cousins. And it's just that really that sort of the drawn back to your community. So it's it's, it's a tough one, and um, it's something that I'm really working with the work that I do today, and and you know the, the goals that I set out to really help other people. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, I guess do you view, in your opinion, because obviously you're living the life at, as a soccer player, getting out to uh work overseas and travel overseas and play overseas, is that a positive for you or did you find that as something that you didn't enjoy as much or you'd rather be able to just play and stay in Australia to further your career? No, I I think it's a, I think it's a good thing because um, if you, you know, some of the players that I did play with, you know, went, you know, I was lucky enough to play with some of the best players that Australia's ever produced and, you know, a lot of them, you know, your Mark Schwartz's, Harry Kuehl, Tim Cahill, Lucas Neal, you know, just a few just a name, but um, they all sort of went over when they were 16, 15, 16 years old. And um, there could have been a couple more that went a little bit later, but, um, you know, that really teaches you how to grow up and you don't, you're not with family, but you're, it's one thing moving away from your family when you're in Australia, but 24-hour flight, 30-hour flight to the other side of the world, it can be very daunting and very and very tough. And uh, that, that gives you the, those players that resilience. And that was the one thing that I loved about playing for Australia is that the boys in the change room, you could be playing Argentina, Brazil, it wouldn't matter who it was, it was just that that resilience that would all hold everyone together and that everyone was play, really proud to play for Australia. So it was that great feeling. I mean, um, one good memory from when I was in Socceroos, we were in the World Cup qualifiers and we played Japan at, at home at Suncorp and we were down and I think um, one of, I can't remember who got sent off, some, I think it might have been Carl Valeri, I think he got sent off for memory, but then you know, we're playing in Japan at home on a terrible pitch at Suncorp. It was very unusual for that, but um, and we were up against it. And I just remember um, us coming back and the way, you know, that we had that backs to the wall, that Aussie, that Aussie spirit, it really, that was the greatest memory of playing with the national team. You know, you're playing against some of the Japanese superstars and these guys are walking into Man United, into the top teams in the Bundesliga and all over Europe, you know, so, but... You know, that, that for me was, you know, it goes back to that resilience and the, the players that I played with really had that character. Yeah, 100%. I reckon Australia is some of the best crowds. It doesn't matter what the sport is, the tennis, the cricket, the soccer. We really get behind our national teams. And, yeah, it's just awesome that you can reflect on that as such a highlight of your career. And, you know, what, um, you know, I didn't play in England or uh, anything like that. But, you know, the one thing that... They do say in the UK that the Aussies is that they've just got a great mentality, you know, and the, the Aussies are really well loved over there. And that's just talking to a lot of the players that have played in the, in the top leagues in, in, in Europe, you know. So, and it's, it's good to know that because you go over and back in my day, if you were an Aussie going over, they're like, who is this, who is this guy? You know, they, they didn't have any respect for Australian football. But now when you play Australia, there, there, there's that respect, you know. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I think I've, despite living in Melbourne, I was actually at that game you speak of against Japan at some corp. I was one of the first, probably one of the first soccer games I ever went to. I went to interstate for that. That was a great memory. But uh, you touched on before uh, this kind of lack of a father figure uh, throughout your career. But um, of course, you, you played for uh, quite a lot longer than most players would. Do you think you turned into a father figure for younger players and uh, kind of reflected what you uh, kind of felt you missed out on? No, but like I was, um, my mentor was like uh, the football, you know, so that was, yeah. you know, that's um, kept me, you know, kept me out of trouble when I was younger. And, you know, the, 
there's the old saying, sport keeps you out of court. And, you know, that's something that I, like to, <laughs> that I like to use because whenever you're, it doesn't matter what level yet you play at, you know, you've always got that connection with the other pe- people in the team and you're always, you, it's, you know, there's probably some study if you, if you if you're around sporting organisation, that's just more often than not, then you're going to be on the right path, you know, because it teaches you life skills. You know, now in business, it's funny because, you know, we used to play prank, pranks on each other in the change room every day. And you learn the street smarts of being a footballer, and it's just funny because in life after football, people can't pull the ball over my eyes, you know. So it's just funny. You get to learn all that street stuff as a footballer. It teaches you, you know, all the right things and turning up. Um, just being late in the national team or with the A League team, there's always fines, and there's always, you know, there's always big things. And being a footballer, even today with, with my wife and three boys, and when we're getting ready to go places, I'm always stressing out that we're going to meet some friends for coffee or whatever, but I've still got that mentality. You know, I hate running late. It's just one thing, and I guess it just teaches you life skills. So when I first finished my career and went into to business, um, you know, I had a, a point there where it was um, I couldn't even put a resume together because, you know, I could probably couldn't even get a job down at McDonald's down, down the road because um, I didn't have – I didn't work anywhere. My, my job was being a footballer, and I guess it's so hard for – Footballers, when you do finish up, that you know, I mean, typically didn't have more my, my ducks in a row, as uh, uh, you know, pretty typical. But um, yeah, so and then, but then it wasn't until I met uh, a good friend of mine. She helped me with a bit of the marketing side of, of business and, and things like that. And she said, "You you got all the skills, and you just don't know it. You know, they're all up here, not on paper." So and it's very very similar to business and football is um, very very similar. You know, if you apply yourself, you work hard. You know, um, and you have that, that that drive and direction. You know, you're going to do well. It doesn't matter what you do. Yeah, going back to the start of what you said about pranks with teammates, I feel, I'd like to touch on that a little bit more because I know like the camaraderie of sports and the mateship is what makes it so enjoyable. And I guess being in that professional environment, you obviously like to let off a bit of steam. Could you please touch on some of the the best pranks that you experienced, maybe at your expense or dishing out on others? And um. where <laughs> there was an um, um there was there was one time with Archie Thompson we used to room together a lot and it was he got up to go to the toilet he used to room in the in the rooms right yeah 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 I heard him get up and he's stumbling around a bit and then turn the water off and, and you know had to do the number one or whatever but yeah because his bed's right next to mine right and it's quite dark so then he's coming back flush the toilet and then he turns the light off. So then I jump in his bed and pull the covers over. And he's reaching around trying to find it. And when he shit himself that bad, he was funny because he felt another body in his bed. He nearly jumped and hit the roof, you know. So it was just funny. Like, just, just things like that, you know. Like it's just fun, you know. But there are other things like you just do dumb things and you're always taking someone's boot or you're doing something, you know. So, but um, no, they're just little things off the top of your head that you remember that you always get a bit of a giggle out, you know. So <laughs> yeah. and you always seem to sit around the same boys. When you when you've got a, a mind like mine and a bit in, immature at times, uh, when you're playing pranks on each other, you always seem to get those sorts of um, characters around you. Yeah, and it's it's good to hear being in this kind of ultra professional competitive sporting environment as a young guy growing up. Uh, it's probably not too dissimilar from uh, how Lockie's spending his 20s and how I'm going to spend my 20s. It's Yeah, it's just nice to see parallels, whatever career path you choose. But uh, speaking about NSL and A-League, I, I just want to touch on that a bit more. So you, you've won numerous trophies across the two competitions, new and old in Australian football. What, what, what do you reckon your favourite one was to win? There's, they're all different. You know, like... um. So I won the NSL as a youngster when I was 19 with the Olympic. That was pretty special. Um, then I won one as captain as, at Newcastle. Mm. And, you know, it's, it's pretty good to play. Although we we qualified for a – oh, no, no, sorry, we played Central Coast. So, you know, it wasn't a home ground because we played at the Sydney Football Stadium against Central Coast. But, you know, being the captain of Newcastle Jets, and it was not too far from where I grew up and – all my family and friends were, were there to see it, which was which was which was really special. But I always wanted to play. I think every grand final I played, except for the Brisbane Raw one, they're all away from home, and that was my first one playing at home in front of you know fifty odd thousand you know screaming screaming fans. And I'd have to say playing against Western Sydney and the atmosphere that they brought, yeah, um, was was out of this world. So and uh, it was just a really 
the way we won it, we were, I think Matty Baranovic, um, he scored. We were playing catch-up. I think uh, Barisha scored for one, one all and we went into extra time. And then, yeah, Enrique, the slippery fish, got yeah. us home in extra time. So, yeah, it was it – was, it was, um, and the players that we had that in, in that team as well, we – you know, it was, um, you know, all, all the grand finals that, that I've played and been a part of has had some special players. And, and another great honour of your career was captaining your country. I, I'd love for you to touch on what that honour it was to be able to walk out and captain Australia. Yeah, no, look, it was, um, I got the captain, but, you know, um, Harry Kuehl, he led the team out because it was, uh, we played um, Singapore and it was just a friendly game before we played uh, China in, I think, Kuming. We we're going to go there and play. Um, yeah, so there was half A League players, and then we we're waiting for the European boys, but they couldn't get released um, because they were due to games. So they could only fly in 24 hours or whatever, 48 hours or whatever it was before the game um, against China. So we had a bit of a breakup. And then Q uh, played, and unfortunately, he got injured at half time. And then Pin Verbe, um I was looking around the room, and I just won with the, the Jets as a captain. And he just said, through the, the captain's arm, I, mean, I looked up and he goes, yeah, you're leading the team. I was like, oh, right. so yeah, it was pretty cool. You know, it was pretty pretty special, pretty special moment. And even though it, it wasn't from the start, but it was, um, you know, it goes down as, um, you know, one of the, one of the captains to ever, yeah, to ever lead a, lead a team out. And I guess captaining your country, you obviously had exemplary leadership skills. For you, what did you think that you brought to the table in terms of leadership? Because there's obviously so many different approaches that people can have. No, I just think it's um, yeah, it's just recognition for the season that I had with the players that I played with that year, and that was just icing on the cake. And that doesn't come without thanking everyone that I shared that, you know, with the Newcastle Jets. And you know, everything comes off back back of success, and we had a successful season that year. And you know, we were we were a really tight group, and then went on to not only win the league, and we had a lot of doubt. We had a lot of people saying we weren't going to make the top six and we ended up finishing second, I think it was, you know, so um, just behind Central Coast. So, you know, it was, it was a great, great feeling and it was just pretty much, um, you know, a, a sort of icing on the cake and a reward for all the hard work that we'd done at the Jets that year. Yeah, just the, those leadership skills that um, you've kind of acquired throughout your career. It's, um, yeah, just inspirational to see uh, like I have a great man like this on our podcast. It's really good to see. But kind of going to a bit of a um, darker place, I guess, it could be a bit of a touchy issue. So it, like speak about it as much or as little as you want. It's absolutely fine. But you've spoken pretty openly about uh, some mental health issues you've had throughout your career. And I, I think it's really good now how people are speaking more about uh, this kind of thing these days. But uh, I know you've spoken about on other interviews before about – hiding your race from the football community for uh, quite a while and until you were in your 20s or late teens, I think. Yeah. so. no, it's good. Even towards the end of my career and now in business, you know, I, I sit in front of corporates as well and, you know, have discussions around the mental health and, you know, people used to see the Jade Dorf that used to, you know, sit, you know, they'd sit there and then watch you on TV and not know what happens behind the closed doors and I, I started to sort of get, well, it was when I went to Newcastle, and you know, I was as a young kid, I was going out a lot and um, just enjoying trying to be a, a young, young sort of person and trying to fit in at, you know, as normal as I could, even though I was a professional athlete. And I guess what's hard as a professional athlete, you don't so many sacrifices that you've got to make, you you miss out on a lot of things as well. And it wasn't until sort of my late twenties I was going to weddings for the first time, or there was certain birthdays I was going to, you know, so, but this, what I'm trying to say here is that you're so, you're so, as a, an athlete, you're sort of hidden away from society in, in some respects, you know, you just got to get up, you got to go training, you got to do your recovery, you got to make sure you're ready for tomorrow, you know, so it's all, it's like being in the military and, and it was, wasn't, and then at the same time, you, after a game, you want to, you know, go out and celebrate and hang out with the boys and, and all that sort of stuff and then it wasn't until I was sort of, 20, by 24, 25, when I, when I met my partner and, and you know, we're having a, a child at 25 years old and that was the season that we won the, the grand final and the captain has, you know, all these things and not making, you know, 
getting to that certain age, I'm going, you know, getting a, having a family now. Am I going to be able to support them? Am I you're going to be able to be the man that's going to take this family? You know, and there's all these sort of um, these sort of. Um, but I, I guess there was a lot of um, sort of hate and a lot of anger um, from when I was younger, not having a, a father around. I think you know there was always that that anxiety. Of, and you were always worried, and you were always, um, you know, those things was a bit of a build-up, and and I guess these things, and, and then you know, I had racial um, abuse when I was playing in the NSL, and I won't name which club it was, but it was, you know, um, you know, just those sorts of things. You and that that sort of stuff, you're just embarrassed to be able to come out and say that you're an Indigenous person because of the the, the microscope that Indigenous people unfortunately are in this country. And all the alcohol and the, the drug, you know, just the things that get associated. And and when you're growing up in a sort of rich man's sport, you know, it's to be a minority. It's it's um it's you know you just you just want to try and fit in. And there used to be racial even at training when I was younger and throughout my career. And you just used to hear the racial um, comments not directed at you, but it was indirectly about something else, and it just made you feel. Like a, it just made you feel shit, you know, like a piece of shit, basically. And until you live in someone's shoes and what you go through, and not having money, not having, you know, um, the privileges of, you know, buying boots or buying new clothes and all those sorts of things that, you know, for the everyday people that, that can afford it. But you know, it's a bit of a build up of all those sorts of things. And I guess when it get to when it got to sort of like that point where I was having a family and not making the soccer, I was playing with you, you know, all these top footballers that were playing. You know, when Gus Hink was the coach as well, you know, they're playing in the top leagues of, in, around the world, you know, and they're all, you know, talking about, you know, renewing their contracts or getting a new contract. And so all those sorts of things and going out all the time. So it, it, it was a it was a bit of a time of my, my life. I didn't know what was happening. And it just got to a point where I didn't know how to deal with it so bad. And then I started getting all these physical sort of um, – it's like a physical – I thought something was wrong with me. I did all the tests under the, in the world, all, you know, um, your blood test. Your, it was like I had this really bad um, virus and I couldn't work out for the life of me what, what was going on. Um, and it was was going on for, you know, it going for a week, two weeks, three weeks, and I wasn't getting better. I'm like, what, what is going on? What is going on? And the more I started thinking about it, the worse it got. And I just started to build, started to build, started to build, and I couldn't really talk to anyone. I didn't know what the, what the hell was going on. And it wasn't until when I was at the Jets when I spoke to one of the, the best doctors and a great friend of mine, Neil Halpin. He was uh, used to be the doctor for the, um, I believe he's still the doctor today in the A League for the Jets and um, the Knights, the, the Newcastle Knights doctor. And he took me in and sort of, you know, I didn't know what was going on. And I had a few meetings with him, and he's one of the most experienced doctors around. And he's and once you've cancelled, it's a process of elimination. You know, you do your bloods, do this, that, whatever. So if you're physically okay, then they move on to something else. It could be something mentally, you know. So, um, and that's when I sort of um, um, fell into, like, not fell into, but I got diagnosed, you know, helping diagnose you with depression. And then that's when I sort of, and it's, it, there's a bit of a phase with it. There's a, you know, there's a bit in denial sort of um, phase. That, that, that tends to occur when someone, you know, like myself, you're so happy, you're with your mates, you're playing the game you love, and, you know, what possibly could be wrong? I was with the national team, you know, I was winning, I was winning titles with, the, with Newcastle, and, you know, I just went, I won the trophy with Newcastle, everyone's jumping around celebrating while I'm sitting in the corner, like, feeling like, you know, but my world's about to end. I couldn't get a smile on my face, and when I moved to South Korea, not too long after that, I was on medication as well for depression. And um, and they just made me even worse. And I felt like a zombie. So I was even playing as a right back when I was in the K League for an inch on United, and and I was worrying about everything else in the stadium. So I had a lot of anxiety as well, and depression, anxiety. So it was like sort of one was feeding off the other, and and then I remember I'd be playing a right back, and I'm, the ball's coming over. And I'm thinking if that if the ball's coming over, I thought it was like a, like a little pea. You know, how am I going to control it? I'm thinking about what I was supposed to do next and I'll just, you know, the saying, worry yourself sick, that's that's pretty much what I was, I didn't know what was happening, so I was um, like basically worrying myself sick, you know, so and there would be moments where I'd be sitting in the shower for, you know, half an hour, an hour before the day starts just to 
that was the only the only comfort that I'd get. You know, by you know, when you're overseas, it's you know, minus fifteen degrees outside. You're in a training camp in the in the mountains of Korea. No one speaks English. You know, and you're away from your families. You know, for you know about two months, doing double sessions every day. So that physical impact on your body while you're going through this mental stuff can really be challenging. And um, and it wasn't until I sort of recognised it, went and got help, and then got the treatment. And the treatment was a lot of, you know, I did start on medication, but at the same time, you know, I got off the medication and I started, you know, thinking more positively, you know, don't have the negative thoughts in your mind. You, know, you hear that all the time. And it's so true. And, um, you know, it, it took a little while. You know, after about three, four months, I was starting to come good. I was getting better. I was getting better. And then, you know, it does take a long time because there would be times when I'm waking up and I'm driving around when I'm in South Korea. I'm going, how come I'm not, how come I'm not feeling shit today? And as soon as that then it started from sick again, you know? So there was always like a little bit of a trigger. So it's like a really weird thing until you start to weed that out and start to become good. But um, but now I'm, I'm fine. I've been great for years. And I know when the triggers are coming on, it's actually it's actually made me stronger. And um, it, mental health, it is a, it is a really, really, um, it's, a, it's a sickness. It's, a, it's an illness, you know? And all it is is just like having a, you know, an injury, and then you just got to get it better. You know, you just got to see, like, okay, there's different levels of mental health, but, you know, the first things are to, to go and seek help. Yeah, yeah, mate. And I've just got to applaud you for the courage you've shown with uh, speaking about that kind of thing and how it just spirals from one thing to another, like uh, like the racism in the NSL 25 years ago now to – uh, like when you're in the K League and no one's speaking English, it's um can be quite confronting, for pe- quite confronting for people. But I think it's really good that you're speaking about this. So, yeah, just good on you for speaking about that. And uh, yeah, I, ho- I hope it kind of uh, inspires and motivates more people to um, kind of seek help if they need it, and uh, kind of notice that if something's not right in their head, you can speak to someone or you can uh, like even speak to us here on the podcast. We're always happy to have a chat or speak to your friends or your family, anyone really. It's yeah. So I, just, just, I, I guess there's so many, um, it's good these days there's so, there's, because you've got social media and you can hit a more, um, a lot more people than you could back in the day. And you know, there are a lot of um, places where you can see, you know, online or whether you, your doctor or whoever you feel comfortable. I guess it's just whoever you feel comfortable. And at the time it was a, happened to be a doctor and he knew a lot about mental health with a lot of players that he, he, he over the years that particularly men. And, you know, it's, I think a lot of guys do carry that burden. Like, he, it's, it's not cool. You, like, you've got to keep it in. You, you don't want to say anything to anyone, but it's, it's the best thing because, you know, you've got to, you've got to let, them, let it out sometimes. And, and it could be your next door neighbor, it could be a friend. That's new, who knows? But, um, you know, and that's the good thing with, uh, with a lot of sport today. There are people within the game. That you can go and see, and it could be particularly with, with the A League or whoever it might be. And I know Arnie, you know, um, does a great job with the national team, and I've heard great reports. You know, that not everyone, um, you know, there's people there that you can see, and um, because if you don't have this right, how are you going to kick a ball around? You know, it's all about, um, and then that's that's what I guess. You know, you, you get judged as a footballer because there were times where you're thinking about being sick the whole game instead of performing. You know, and um, so you're battling with that. You're battling with the game, and you're battling to try and be a professional footballer. So, you know, it, it was tough, but you know, it's um, it's great now. I can tell my story. Yeah, and some something I picked up on when you were uh, answering the previous question was uh, the racist abuse that you copped th- uh, in your NSL days. Oh, I'm not sure if you mentioned in the A-League as well, but definitely in NSL days. And uh, I was quite, uh, I don't know if I should be, but shocked really because uh, soccer, football is kind of uh, markets itself and is known as this kind of sport for everyone. The, the world game is so diverse uh, compared to your Aussie rules or your rugby league, which are these kind of, macho, tough guys, um, big, like, uh, kind of alpha male thing, whereas uh, soccer's, you, like, not many people would probably think that kind of thing would happen, but it's, uh, yeah, it was quite confronting to hear that, mate. Yeah, no, look, it's, a, it's only a small group of society that, that do it. It's not everyone, 
And it's um, but yeah, but some of these small groups they do at a sporting event, they you know some do get together, and it's it's a chance to you know even on social media these days, and I'm probably an older sort of generation of all this sort of stuff, but now you hear a lot of um this stuff online with the bullying and the racism, you know, like because anyone now can just pick up a phone, you know, the Instagram and and what have you, and be like a keyboard warrior and tell you your thoughts. And I guess those are sorts of things when, you, when you're when younger, you know, you used to hear all the reports and, you know, um, you didn't play well, you didn't do this well. So it was always, I guess, from a racism point of view, it was it was tough back in, when I was younger, but also, you know, it's a pressure, like you're not performing or you play well or you just just because you weren't an overseas player at the time, you get, you get judged on being a product of the A-League or you're not playing in a... Uh, what they probably see as a, as a higher level in Europe somewhere. So, uh, you know, and I feel sorry for a lot of the youngsters playing today in any code that anyone can sort of sit behind a, you know, a phone or a computer or whatever it is and then you know, judge that person that they don't know and they don't know what happens behind those closed doors when they go home, you know. So, um, yeah, we've got, I think we've come a long way, you know, especially in terms of, you know, us Australians as, you know, I, I want to be able to, you know, move forward together as a, as a nation and, you know, pull these things behind, you know, and you see, uh, you know, things like Australia Day and all that sort of stuff, it's something that I don't look forward to because of the, you know, you hear mixed reports on this, you know, the reason I'm getting to this is because it's a sport and, and, and life, it's, you know, when it comes around racism, it's it's, it's it's all in one, you know, and I think Australia has, has come a long way in, in racism in the country and I've always been a big advocate for uh, racism in football. So, you know, I've seen the, the steps and the progression that we are Australians that we, especially with social media these days, we can, it's a platform to let, you know, Australia know about um, the dark history, especially with Indigenous in this country as well. I don't, I don't think we're educated enough on that and what used to go on, but, you know, it's, we're moving forward and it's a great step. Yeah, and... Sorry, just lucky before I throw you, I just need to correct myself from where I was saying before. I was, I think I kind of gave the impression that uh, there is no racism in soccer, football, but of course, there was that awful uh, racial abuse that uh, the Adelaide United player Yengi copped from some Melbourne Victory fans a few weeks ago. And I'm sure uh, there's a lot more, which is just awful to see and hear about whatever the sport, whatever the uh, time, place, wherever it's awful. But lucky, I'll throw back to you. Yeah, I was going to say, because um, Jay touched on something really interesting, and yes, I'm still here to our listeners. I've just been quiet for the <laughs> for, for a bit. But it is interesting, though, because in history, yeah, you're right, we don't we don't learn about that at school. You know, we'll, we learn about the gold rush. That's about, learn about, I guess, Australia becoming a federation, and then that's about it in our history classes. You know, we learn about Europe, but it's not touched on enough. And I think you've raised a great point that it really should be at least added to the education syllabus, because from a young age, we should be taught about the the part of our history, the part, the nice parts, like the gold rush, and then the obviously not so nice parts. No, I just think, um, you know, we've got a great history of, you know, all different nationalities and, you know, we wouldn't be Australia today if we didn't have, you know, all the migrants we do today. So it, we're thankful that we are who we are today and that's what makes me even proud of Australia today is um, who the people we've got here today So and moving forward as a country. So, um, yes, we... We do have certain things in history that, you know, was, wasn't great, but, you know, it's about now and moving forward and, you know, I like to educate, you know, my people that I, youngsters that I deal with and, and Indigenous, and, you know, you don't, you're not born into this world to, to hate another colour. You're there to, yeah, that's only a taught, um, uh, how do you say, it? just uneducated people, you know, so, um, and that's only a small group. It's, um, Australia's a beautiful place and got great people in it. So, you know, um, and I've played with fantastic players through my career, especially with the national team. If anything, you, as a national team, you embrace, you know, all the different nationalities, football and A-League, you embrace, you know. So, and it's, um, yeah, I can, um, I can not fault the A-League or the Socceroos or the work and everything that I've been involved in. Um, it's, it's been fantastic. Yeah, and uh, it's just great to hear chat about in this whole interview the amazing successful career you've had and 
uh, I want to just throw over to you to talk about the successful business career you have in uh, post-football career because I know we chatted quite a bit about it in our first take of this podcast. But, uh, yeah, just what, what are you doing these days with yourself? Yeah, so I'm in business with uh, um, Adam Serrata, who's an ex a league boy. Um, played for the Brisbane Raw as well. Played over in in, in Holland in, in Germany. So I'm business partners with him at the moment. And another um, another player, he likes to pump himself up as well as a footballer. But he he did um, play for the Kangaroo Cup in the twelves. That's his home oh. to um, Scott Summers, and um, he's one of our business partners. So we're probably better than us, Harps. Yeah, yeah that's still higher than that, us. <laughs> no, it's, it's been great. Um, so we have like a landscape construction and a steel fabrication company. So um, it's an Indigenous owned and controlled, certified by Supply Nation, which is a platform for Indigenous businesses to be able to connect with Tier 1 um, clients, you know, such as uh, we're talking to a lot of the, um, you know, um, a lot of government departments at the moment, um, and also, you know, we're talking to construction companies. So we're a... In the process, so we've got a, one of the, a steel fabrication company, which is in Brendale, north of Brisbane, which has gone under an acre of six bays of um, steel fab- fabrication. So we do a lot of that, you know, it's, um, all your know, stainless uh, aluminium, brass, um, all those different handrails, bollards, um, you know, just anywhere that anything aluminium in, in structural steel, we can pretty much um, fabricate. So we've got a, a laser cutter machine as well. So we've got about uh, 60 staff in the steel fabrication side and with the landscape construction, we've got about 20 staff there as well. So ours is all about, you know, um, employing the right people as well and um, obviously Indigenous employment is, is, a, is big for us because obviously being an owned and controlled 66% owned Indigenous company. In terms of our scale, we've, at the scale that we're at, obviously with the staff under us, you know, we probably one of the biggest steel fabric Indigenous science steel fabrication companies in, in Australia. So I've been with the company now just before Christmas. And um, it's a, you know, um, Adam's been up and he's the managing director. So um, he's been with it just really, really just over just over a year now. So um, it's, been, it's been going great, going, doing a lot of meetings, taking people out to sporting events, you know, doing all the smoothing stuff, you know, stuff that I'm kind of overqualified as a football <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, it's been going good. It's, it's a lot of fun. And when you're working with um, you know, people that you really enjoy their you know, company and very, um, you know, for Scotty as well, to really help us with the sort of the, the corporate the corporate world as well. I mean, he's, a, he's only a couple of years older than me, but he's been a 20-year CEO. He's had financial planning businesses as well. You're talking the top end of financial planning businesses here in, in Queensland. So we're getting a lot of, um, you know, he's got a lot of drive and you know, he's had a lot of success behind him as well. So it's just great, um, yeah, and it's, it's a lot of fun. So, um, yeah, we're making some ground at the moment. Mate, it's so cool to hear how passionate you are about your business, And but then you also do a lot of charity work. Can you discuss a bit about that? Yeah, so I, I'm an ambassador for, for a charity called Give It, so G-I-V-I-T. It's a Brisbane-based, started off as a Brisbane-based um, charity. Now it's grown to a, a national um, company and so, so it's an online warehouse so people can donate items or goods to just for example if you've got you know sometimes in your garage you might have um, clothing you might have shoes it might be just you know all bits and pieces that someone else could really do with and, and, and really benefit from so and if you're a person in need or disadvantage you know, I mean ambassador for the Indigenous part of the, the company as well. So um, I can give you a bit of a story of how to give it work. So um, so if you've got those items in, the, in your garage or your house or whatever and you want to donate, so you just hold the you hold it until it's needed. So um, and that person has to go through and register. You can't be just Joe below down the street that wants a new pool table. <laughs> you have to fit the criteria. And there's some stories around like a you know especially in my field that I'm dealing with but there was an Indigenous lady who came out from a domestic violent, um, abusive uh, relationship, left the, the partner, but had three kids and sort of got a place, but, you know, through the social housing, but also couldn't really afford any furniture or any bedding or, you know, clothes for the kids. So she uh, registered with her local charity 
then that local charity then will go to give it. And then it's like a criteria to check this, and then they'll register that person, and then she'll say, I need X, Y, Z, have as many items as you need, and then give it was fortunate enough to reach out to the network, and people donated it, and then was able to give them the goods so they can, you know, um, you know have, have a good life, you know. So, um, so those are things, and those are the things I promote. I work with a lot of Indigenous communities as well. So it's just, you know, especially with the bushfires as well. Um, a lot of the, um, I guess what kids in the background. So, but um, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the farmers now lost a lot of tools in their sheds. And so give it, we're, we're able to help those farmers in need, you know, just going back just over a year ago now. So, um, yeah, so it's, 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 a, it's a great charity, one that I've been an ambassador for and, um, they, you know, in, in the organisation, they're just great people as well. So. Um, and I've got a lot of time for Gibbet Foundation. Yeah, and uh, I believe we'll speak a bit more about them after our quiz. But uh, it's, I know you founded uh, Kicking with a Cuz. Is that still going? Yeah, so that was um, a charity that I brought, but um, that was more so you know, in the uh, for holidays for kids that can't afford clinics and things like that. So I'd, you know, I'd always um, go down and take some plays with me or whoever it might be, um, get the local, like going to schools as well, so especially down here in Logan, uh, Ipswich. And when I was down in Sydney as well, we will have holiday breaks as well because my wife's family's from down the south coast, down past Wollongong. You know, I'd, I'd get the kids three, four buses up from Nara and just do, you know, three to four hour block clinics with the kids or go over two or three days. And the kids don't have to pay anything. Everything's provided, you know, food, food, um, they get some some of them get uh, you know um, little packs and things like that to take away, just little things to put memories in. But, but the, the best thing was just getting them all together and it was all for free. So um, yeah, it was great fun. And um, yeah, so it is it is still active, but it's just finding the time. So Am- Amaru, the, the company landscape group that I'm with now, we want to get more actively involved in that and um, be able to donate our time and go to schools and. and the kids active. Mate, yeah, that just sounds amazing. They're such great causes and can see just how you're constantly giving back to the community, which is something that I really admire and something that's really inspiring. And I think anybody out there, if you can help anybody, it doesn't matter whether even if it's just going to your elderly neighbours, help asking them, like helping them with their uh, groceries or whatever, whatever it is, like it's just yeah, it's something really amazing. It's really inspiring for me to go out there. I want, I want to go help people now after hearing about all the help that you do. Um, now, it can't, our final question before we get to the famous quiz, but it is the most important in our view. It is, what do you have a life philosophy? Are there any few words that you sort of live by, any quotes or just a simple thought? No, I just think um, there's one type of words you used to use. It. The more you practice, the luckier you get. I used to like that one growing up. Yeah, that's good. That that will go in our book of life philosophies that we've got from all our guests. Uh, but, uh, Jade, I'm not sure if you've listened to the show before. You probably haven't, but I know Lockie definitely knows about this uh, <laughs> segment. So uh, our final segment of the show is the world famous Where Do We Begin quiz. So... Uh, I've got the honours of hosting this one between you, Jade, and you, Lockie. So I'm going to ask five questions. All of these questions have some vague connection uh, to your career, Jade. Okay. Are you ready to go? Yep. Let's go. Okay. Uh, so am I correct in saying your birthday is January 7, 1982? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that, that's, not that that's, not, that's not for points. That's not for points. My question is, which song – with the lyrics that I'm about to read out, was at number one in Australia on that very same day, January 7, 1982. So I'm going to read out the lyrics. Travelling in a fried out combi. Uh, Land hippie... Down Under, is it? Yep, spot on. Down Under by Men at Work. Uh, a classic, of course. I've asked that kind of question a few times. That's the quickest someone's got it, so very well done. It's an iconic tune, of course. Uh, but question two, Jade's 1-0 up, lucky. Oh, that, well, okay, uh, I'll take that answer. <laughs> <laughs> question two. So, of course, you had uh, 41 caps for the Socceroos. So my question is, in which 1999 film was Morpheus aggressively questioned in the 41st floor of the government building? Matrix, isn't it? Leon. 
Absolutely correct. The Matrix. He's nailed it. He's two nil up. Uh, I wanted to get his confidence up, mate. That's <laughs> that just makes it way more satisfying. <laughs> B- build him up so you can bring him down. Yeah, of course, of course. You do that to our mate Andy. Neon, Neon, mate. Is it Neon? Like I said, Neon. That's him. Oh, oh, Neo, Neo. That's Neo, him, mate. Is it? Yeah, Neo. Neo. Of course. I call for an impartial judge. That shouldn't be paid half. <laughs> <laughs> no, he got the movie. That's all right. He's two nil up. Uh, so we'll go to question three. So TVB Jade is a Hong Kong free-to-air television channel broadcast in the the predominant language of Hong Kong. What is this language? Mandarin. Mandarin is incorrect. Waki. Waki. Ah, Cantonese. He's nailed it. Cantonese is absolutely correct. I would have gone Mandarin too. Thanks, Jay. <laughs> learned, sometimes, learned, sometimes it's not best to be the quickest. Uh, I, learned, I did learn Chinese at school and I have a grew up with a lot of Chinese friends. So I thought, <laughs> I thought that was one of the, the languages. So uh, there you go. There you go, indeed. Uh, Jay remains oh, – well, he's still up. He's 2-1 up. So, uh, of course, your surname. We've covered Jade in question three. We're covering your surname now. North in question four. So – Excluding non-mainland territories such as Greenland, what is the northernmost country on Earth? Finland. Do you say Finland? Greenland, I mean. Oh, great. Well, uh, I said uh, Greenland doesn't count. Greenland's part oh. of Denmark, but it's an overseas right. territory, so I'm not going to count. I'll give you another shot, though. Lucky. Lucky? Ah. Oh. So northernmost. Northernmost, yeah. Well, I should notice I've played in Tromso in Norway. Past the Arctic Circle. Wow. Okay, can I throw it to Jade so I don't want to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jade can have a crack. (laughs) Jade can have a crack. Do you have a go, Jade? I think it's one of those. It's got to be one of those Scandinavian. What's your answer? Which one? If I'm lucky. (laughs) Oh, geez. Back and forth. Lucky. Do you want to have a go? I'll go Finland. Actually, I've got. No, actually, I'll. I'll just go Denmark because you said Greenland was, uh, I don't know, I'll just go Denmark. Denmark's incorrect. Mm. Yeah. I'll go Finland. Denmark's lower. Yeah, yeah, Denmark's uh, borders Germany. Yeah. Uh, Finland is also incorrect. Mm. Neither of you were very close. Canada. It's Russia. Oh, Canada. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, there you go. Not even Scandinavia. So, uh, Jade's 2 1 up, but. Lockie is still in with a shot of winning it because uh, our, all our listeners know how this works. Question five, it's our who am I question. So I'm going to go down from five points all the way down to one point with a series of clues uh, about who I am. And once you've buzzed in, uh, you can't buzz in, once you've buzzed in and get it wrong, I meant to say, uh, you can't buzz in again until the other person gets it wrong. So uh, Lockie needs two points to win it outright. So I'm going to start with the five point clue. I was born on September 26, 1981 in Saginaw, Michigan, in the United States of America. We'll move on to the four-point clue. That's a bit tough from there. So the four-point clue, uh, since turning pro a month after my 14th birthday, I've become a four-time Olympic gold medalist and one of the greats of my sport. Four Olympic gold medals, okay. I'll move on to the three-point clue. I've made more than 120 million Australian dollars in career prize money, 70 million ahead of the next highest earning athlete in my family. Jade. Jade? I was thinking some NBA player. Michigan. Uh, I don't know. Um, what is it? You can't go back, can you? I can't ask her. Uh, well, no, well, if you haven't answered the question, uh, I can move on to the next clue if you want. Do you want me to move okay. on to the next one? No, no, sorry. So, so was it four-time Olympic gold medalist or four-time Olympian half? Uh, four-time Olympic gold medalist and one of the greats of my sport. Born on the 26th, 26th of September 1981 in Michigan. And has it earned $100 million of prize money? $20 million Aussie dollars, $70 million ahead of the next highest earning athlete in my family. I reckon. Do you want me to move on to the two point clue? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I I'll move know on to the two is. point clue. So Lockie's got to get it here to win it outright if we don't want to go to a tiebreaker. So on the 6th of July 2002, which was the date of your soccer a- Socceroos debut, Jade, I won the first of my seven Wimbledon titles. Lockie. Lockie. Knew it. Serena Williams. Serena Williams. Get a bit of a drum roll going. 
correct. Well done, Very well done. Very well done. Jeez, Jay. If you got the in. first two, you got confident, mate, but uh, <laughs> pressure creates diamonds. <laughs> of course. No, well done, mate. I wouldn't have picked that anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm thinking, who's got the brother or sister that's the next one? Yeah, that's yeah. the one that gave it to me because uh, I'm like, oh, it would have to, it'd be Venus. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, Venus is correct. with $50 million in career prize money. And I was having a look. Serena Williams, number one for 186 consecutive and 319 total weeks. It's just astonishing. But uh, after our quiz, we let our guests plug a little charity that's close to their hearts. I know what one you're going to plug, Jade. This is extremely close to your heart, being an ambassador for their charity. What's your charity that you'd like to plug today? With, yeah, with Give It. Yeah, Give It. Yeah, okay. I, so, I gave it a bit of a plug yeah. before, but yeah. Um, where uh, can people check out Give It? Do you know? You can just go on the line. It's um, G-I-V-I-T, give it.com.au, and just, um, yeah, it, all the details will be there. So, And it's a, it's a great charity. It's a great cause, and, um, you know, it does provide people that are in need. Yeah. Great, mate. Uh, well, and we'll um, plug those uh, websites and the socials again and encourage people to donate at the end of the show because uh, every cent, every dollar counts that you could donate to all the charities that our guests uh give a plug to but uh i'd love to chat more about your football career i don't think we really did it justice because we there's so much interesting stuff to talk about with, with you jade north but thank you very much for coming on it's been a pleasure thanks guys and um you know keep up the good work and look forward to hearing the other podcasts Thanks so much for that, Jade. Absolutely loved every second of getting to chat to you. I've learned so much and it was so much fun. Yeah, yeah, absolute cracker. I hope you guys all enjoyed it as well. I trust that you all enjoyed it uh, just as much as we did. But, uh, Lockie, our charity of the week, the traditional outro segment, listeners already know uh, who Jade has nominated. Uh, Give us some details, please is give it so it basically offers it's a facilitation method in that that people can donate their items and things that they don't need and give it will then facilitate it to the right people so they've done a lot of things the most recent one is that they're helping out with the new south wales and queensland floods you know you can donate anything from clothes to rugs to sheets uh, really anything or money of course donated to the charity and it's, it's really an awesome charity really different and something that i'm really stoked that we get the chance to uh to promote it this week yeah, yeah, it's really good. And uh, like you said, you can donate your any items, really. Donate your time, even, like volunteering for them. They would appreciate that so much. Or, of course, just donate your funds. Do whatever you can. Uh, all of us here at Where Do We Begin, or well, us too, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> everyone that give it helps uh, and give it themselves would really, really appreciate it. So you can check them out at giveit.org.au. That's give it without an E. So G-I-V-I-T dot org au they uh, really would appreciate anything you could donate and we would love you for it and we'd also just love to thank of course apart from jade is our lovely listeners thanks so much for sticking around for the journey we got some great episodes coming up so we're looking forward to you listening to us then yeah we would really appreciate any recommendations you could give of course subscribe share support thanks for listening guys see you next monday see ya